Well, let me start by by thanking Q2B and in particular Yanni and Matt uh, at QCWare for putting together this industry defining conference and for persisting during what's been, to put it mildly, a difficult year and for inviting me to speak. So I'm Matt Langioni. I'm a principal at the Boston Consulting Group, where I work in the tech sector with a special emphasis on research inflected deep tech. Quantum computing is, of course, the example par excellence of that. Uh, really glad to be here. So by now, you'll have a, a, had a thoroughgoing introduction to the science behind quantum computing from Professor Childs on strategic decisions related to the future of quantum computing from Eric Schmidt and on the market landscape from Bob Sorensen. I won't linger long on topics more capably covered by others. Uh, instead, I'll focus these remarks on two questions. One, where will quantum computing create value? In what industries and what use cases? And when? Relatedly, how can we accelerate that timeline? I will uh, permit myself to start with a metaphor that may help those who are still in the early stages of coming to terms with the exponential nature of quantum compute power. Quantum computing, it's hard to put on a pin. And like all simple explanations, this one will be oversimplifying, but perhaps instructive as we move to describe what sorts of problems quantum computing can solve. You'll have heard that quantum computers are enable departure from two classical constraints of semiconductor computing. Um, classical computers operate deterministically, either, either everything's either yes or no, on or off, with no in between, and they operate serially. They can only do one thing at a time. By contrast, quantum computers operate probabilistically and simultaneously. Now, let's illustrate how this works. Imagine a computer is trying to solve a maze. The classical computer would exhaust every potential path in a sequence. If it came across a roadblock on the first path it tried, it would rule that path out, revert to its original position, and try the next logical path, and so on and so forth until it found a solution. A quantum computer could test every single path at once, in effect solving the maze with only a single try. Now this won't matter much. In fact, it'll be hardly perceptible with a small maze. But with a large maze characterized by a complex uh, potential set of route combinations, the difference in calculation time can quickly go from years with a classical computer to minutes with a quantum computer. And a lot of complex problems in business as it happens are characterized by this maze-like quality. I'll discuss a few at a high level, but many more I trust will be covered uh, throughout the day. So I said that a lot of complex problems in business are characterized by this maze-like quality. What I'm referring to when I say that is applications, specific instances of problems that have real business value. But in terms of true problem archetypes, you can trace it to about four where quantum computers have a provable advantage over classical computers. Combinatorial optimization, differential equations, linear algebra, and factorization. And these four problem archetypes, while they seem narrow in scope, they actually open up an extremely wide range of industrially relevant use cases. Now, uh, if, you take a, uh, uh, if you think about combinatorial op optimization as an example, you have what's known as the traveling sales and problem in which the goal or the objective function is to minimize the distance traveled across a number of cities. Now, this isn't so difficult to compute with a few cities, but every added city increases the total field of possibilities exponentially. This is what's called an exploding state space. And it's exactly what you're looking for when you're thinking about problems that have the potential to be what we call quantum advantage, in which they can um, be performed uh, much faster with quantum computers. Now, that's a simple framework for the kinds of problems to look for, but where do you look for them? Even if you narrow the world down to a single industry, like materials, finance, or pharma, how do you build out the path to value? The key to identify uh, uh, value in a given industry is to, is to find the value creation equation. So on one side, you have, uh, you have to answer the question um, that we have here on the y-axis, labeled A. What are the pain points and bottlenecks that lead to cost outlays and missed revenue opportunities in an industry? Those are opportunities, at least theoretically, that exist no matter how they're solved. Classical computers, quantum computers, even with non-technical solutions. And um, the experts to consult uh, on something like this, they're really not quantum computing experts at all, necessarily, but they're the high-frequency traders in finance or chemoinformatics researchers. But quantum computing experts, they do have their role because next, and this is our x-axis labeled B, you need to determine what hardware and software breakthroughs will uh, will need to be achieved in order to reach a level of solution maturity to solve the problem identified by the industry expert. Not all industry problems will require full-scale fault-tolerant computers. There may be, for example, optimized shallow circuit NISC devices that can make progress on simulating highly correlated systems. 
Um, now the yellow line, this is the tricky part. This is the, this is the art. Um, and this is where the value creation um, formula is calculated. Uh, it's where we determine what share of the cost outlay or missed revenue opportunity in an industry can be solved by quantum computers at the given level of solution maturity. And the key here is that you have to account uh, for the rising tide of classical computer capability um, enabled by things like machine learning. You also have to risk adjust for the possibility that something gets solved laterally or with a non-technical solution. This is always the calculus that we apply when we're charting the path to value in an industry or for a given company. To build our sizing, we did it for, uh, for four industries, and they were the ones that were featured on the previous page. We really did a deep bottom-up assessment of the materials industry, biopharma, finance, and CFD. We've since explored further uh, use cases in oil and gas and logistics and others, and then we applied a scale factor to cover all industries based on high-performance compute use to arrive at an estimate for the whole market. So what we typically do is actually go across the, the entire workflow, whether it's a drug discovery workflow or a financial services workflow, and ask what the common method of solving certain problems is today, what the pain points are, what the cost outlays are, and then derive the value unlock with quantum computing. Many businesses are really keen to understand use cases that are far off in recognition of the fact that they have to start building now. And it's actually uh, an approach that we love to see. In finance um, here specifically, there are both near-term use cases related to portfolio optimization, and I'll discuss those in a moment, and others that are, are further off, quite possibly requiring full-scale fault tolerance, such as asset pricing and risk management. Let's start with that, um, with asset pricing, or determining the fair market value of assets under management, um, including complex derivatives. So typically, proprietary in-house solutions and third-party software packages are used um, for these Monte Carlo simulations um, of, of really the entire price pathway tree but it's really, really computationally expensive, especially for longer term complex derivatives. So to overcome this limitation, current models exclude some of the potential input variables that increase the complexity. Now, the advantage in terms of a faster reaction time towards a negative market really can't be understated. Today, large risk simulations run overnight um, over the course of 10 to 12 hours, precluding banks from taking any corrective actions in real time throughout the day. So one hedge fund analyst that we talked to noted that one Monte Carlo he ran to model demand shock impact took a month to converge. Now that simulation started in February of 2020. By the time it finished, the stock market was down 25% uh, and we were under lockdown. So contrast that with the world in which deep quantum circuits are possible, enabled by say, Montanaro's algorithms for backtracking or branch and bound algorithms. Capabilities such as near-time risk assessment for quant hedge funds, tail event, defense strategies, risk-driven uh, HFT, those are all potentially in play. Of course, it's a long way off because they're powered by really greedy algorithms um, that will require error correction, some form of distributed architecture. Um, but if it's a long stick, there's a, there's a big carrot at the end of it. There's a lot of value in problems like this. So uh, in the near term, the most obvious and well-scoped problems around portfolio optimization, arbitrage optimization, strategy and trading costs optimization. Um, and classical optimizers are, again, used for these, but they're limited um, not so much by the number of assets or the number of constraints, but the type of constraints, uh, namely non-continuous and non-convex functions like interest rate yield curves and trading locks, buy-in thresholds, transaction costs. These are the type of things with these really complex optimization services that algorithms like QAOA or VQE um, are really early efforts to address problems like this, um, which will, of course, mature in time. I won't linger long here, but just wanted to give um, a little bit more detail on what we do when we're charting the path to value. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a sense of the complexity of the triangulation you have to make between um, complex industry-specific problems um, and an emerging technology um, that's marked and characterized by, uh, by actual fundamental scientific challenges, not uh, just engineering um, challenges, right? As is typically the case with, um, with more kind of in-paradigm um, technologies. And um, you just saw the materials use case, a kind of deep dive there. But the fact is broadening the aperture across industries to the whole value creation picture, we see that the curve is pretty similar, right? There's real value in the near term, two to $5 billion in terms of net income to end users, the JP Morgans, the BASFs of the world. But the transformative value comes with full scale fault tolerance, which is still um, potentially a decade, two decades off. 
Um, and we picked some of these use cases um, here to draw out. Now, one thing to note is that in our estimation, around 40% of the value of quantum computing will come from these four industries in the near term, right? Um, because for a number of different reasons, including expertise that's already exists, that already exists in the field, willingness to experiment, um, the fit um, according to the problem archetypes. But we expect that to taper off to around 25% uh, in the long term, especially as machine learning um, or quantum uh, powered machine learning um, takes off and matures. So um, we should be reminded that we, we, ha we do have these three periods. Um, the near term, uh, where the technical achievement will be things like error mitigation, data compression, even optimized circuits. Um, we have uh, then broad quantum advantage where we see error con uh, correction. Um, our view is that this period, so um, the broad quantum um, advantage, people ask often, well, how does broad quantum advantage differ from full-scale fault tolerance? Our view here is that this period will be marked by higher fidelity qubits um, and error correction, but still single modules with less than, say, a thousand logical qubits. And what we call full scale fault tolerance is the period marked by really distribution. So, say it's photon based distribution and modularity so that you have error corrected architectures at scale. Um, and there are really discrete problems um, to solve when you talk about limited quantum computers during the first two phases. It takes real creativity to scope and identify problems suitable for full-scale fault-tolerant computers. You need to remove effectively all constraints on your thinking. So if we stick to banks for an example, you could ask yourself a question like this. What if banks were able to lend more freely to entrepreneurs, businesses, and individuals? So one of the key holdups today is that banks need to keep 10 to 15% of assets in cash reserves, in part because their risk simulations are compute constrained. They can't model whole market or global risks that are rare, but severe and unpredictable, such as black swan events. Now, 10 to 15%, it's a lot of money considering that every 1% reduction in reserves creates nearly a trillion dollars in investable capital. So if banks ultimately felt confident enough in quantum powered market simulations to reduce reserves to say five to 10% of assets, the effect would be like a COVID-19 level stimulus package for businesses and individuals every single year. There's a lot of ifs in that statement. Um, but quantum computing, um, the potential of full-scale fault-tolerant fault quantum computing uh, kind of gives you permission to even imagine such a scenario. Um, it is kind of would be the underlying critical enabler of something like that. So now when you look at 10, when we talk about 10 or 20 years, it's tempting to say, let's postpone in investing. But when I hear this line of thinking, I always repair to a quote from uh, one Nobel Prize winning physicist who said, quantum computers are more different from current computers than current computers are from the abacus. It'll take time to make the necessary workflow integration. It'll take time to onboard talent. It'll take time, not to mention vision and imagination, to identify and scope high value problems for quantum computers to tackle. Businesses aren't just going to be able to buy their way into the technology when it matures. There'll be real rewards in terms of skills, talent, IP for the early movers. And kind of in recognition of this fact, governments are investing heavily in quantum technologies, 15 billion or so between China, the US and Europe. And VCs are following suit. When we first conducted this um, exercise of the VC landscape in 2018, there was around $800 million in VC investment over the previous, say, 10 years or more. Um, in the last uh, two years, that's more than doubled. But I think what's needed now to accelerate innovation is, is business investment, in scoping and defining use cases, onboarding talent, and experimenting with real quantum computers. We'll get to that in a moment. But I think before we do, one of the benefits of this flow of government and VC funding is the efflorescence of an ecosystem of diverse players across the tech stack. You've got major hardware players like IBM, Google, and Honeywell. You've got well-established application or abstraction players like QCWare. And of course, uh, you have Cambridge Quantum Computing. Um, but what I'm encouraged by in terms of ecosystem maturity is the emergence of industry-specific application players, especially in finance. Um, multiverse computing, for example, um, is playing there. And if we stick with, with finance, I mean, no industry has been faster to adopt Vanguard technologies than financial services. Um, where spend on IT for risk analytics alone is estimated to range from six to nine billion globally. And spend on HPC uh, is expected to top a billion dollars soon. So it's no surprise that financial institutions, and this is, I think, a great sign for quantum computing um, and for business applications um, in particular, they've been investing and in ramping up quantum talent. 
This is a really highly directional LinkedIn scrape, as we call it, but it shows that already major banks have profiles of 10 or more quote unquote quantum proficient employees. And while it's certainly the case that this is a very rough analysis, some of these profiles detailed on the chart are working at these banks in other capacities, traditional quant capacities, for example, and they're not working directly on quantum. It's also clear that banks are, are, are really among the first to recognize that quantum computing isn't the sort of industry that you just simply show up and start to play, that it takes time um, to build up um, internal capabilities. In order to show, uh, I think, the next step, right? We've talked about governments and venture capitals. We've talked about, um, about financial institutions. But how about businesses that aren't really ready yet to start onboarding talent? What should they do? I think the first thing is, um, we, we've got a couple things. The first is conducting an impact of quantum assessment. And this starts really with a preliminary self-assessment that allows you to understand if quantum is coming to your industry or your business model. And then if there's a there there doing a full impact um, diagnostic, we'll get into what that means in a moment. And the next is co-innovating with a quantum tech provider. Um, we'll get into a, a bit more detail um, on that. But I think the first thing here is the impact of quantum assessment. It's really similar actually in the way that we did the overall um, sizing. So you have a workflow analysis to discover pain points and bottlenecks um, that lead to cost outlays and missed revenue opportunities. And this is kind of quantum agnostic. It's a great autotelic pursuit. Um, we tend to find things in the workflow um, that can be addressed in all sorts of ways. Some of them will require quantum computing. Uh, many of them can be addressed sooner. Um, then there's a solution mapping as we discussed uh, in terms of identifying what quantum um, solutions um, can be mapped to those pain points and when. Uh, and then the path to value assessment, um, which, which helps businesses chart a path to entering, um, entering the industry. Okay. Um, just the benefits of co-innovation um, are, are, are many, right? There are auxiliary rewards in terms of onboarding talent, upskilling, um, but the primary is typically the attempt to find differentiated IP. And some of these partnerships are pursuing this goal with seriousness and really reshaping um, and re reaping early rewards. Barclays, for example, has an interesting paper out with IBM on quantum unconstrained binary optimization and mixed binary optimization approaches to the transaction settlement problem. This, like, like many of these experiments, results in advantages that are, are, are theoretical, meaning that the hardware has to catch up. But there really are, um, there really are rewards um, in terms of learning, talent, upskilling. What I'd like to conclude by saying is just that I'd encourage you to reach out. Um, we're thinking a lot about quantum computing these days, keeping our ear to the ground in terms of investments, use cases, and tech development. And you'll note that I've mentioned a lot about finance. I'm personally passionate about the finance use case for quantum computing because it's a testament to the fact that quantum computing is not just about triumphs in the lab and that it'll exert an important influence across industries. It may be true that nature is quantum mechanical, and therefore quantum computers have certain advantages in simulating nature. But I think that the biggest reason that most of the use cases we've identified and scope for quantum computing um, are related to simulation, whether for drug discovery or for materials design, is simply the fact that many of the folks building quantum computers are material scientists. And one unacknowledged constraint on progress in developing quantum computing is a lack of imagination and experimentation beyond the narrow set of core industries populated by those who studied quantum mechanics and, and PhD programs. The financial services industry is a welcome exception, and I hope a bellwether for what's to come in this exciting field. Thanks, Yanni. Thanks, QCWare.